Welcome to our fourth video in our series on photosynthesis. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the Calvin cycle, or carbon fixation. Now, we spent time in previous videos doing an overview of photosynthesis, and if you need to review that, please do before watching this video. We went through and talked about how photosynthesis occurs in two distinct sets of reactions, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. We took a closer look at the light reactions, both the cyclic and non-cyclic pathways. We showed how uh, ATP and NADPH were produced and how oxygen was given off as a waste product as we absorb light and split water. We even took a closer look at the chemiosmotic photophosphorylation, in other words, how we made that ATP in the light reactions. So in this video, we're going to look at the other side of the picture. We're going to look at the Calvin cycle in detail. So where do we start? We have to start with the chloroplast. Recall that the light reactions occurred in this membrane, the thylakoid. But the Calvin cycle is going to take place in the surrounding liquid called the stroma, and it's going to be aided by a set of enzymes that will help catalyze the reactions required. So, the Calvin cycle. Sometimes the Calvin cycle is called the dark reactions. It's kind of like a counterbalance to the light reactions. But I'm not uh, so hip on that term because uh, the Calvin cycle doesn't take place in the dark. It actually takes place during the day. So um, I don't tend to use that term. So we'll just mark that out. Um, other people will call the Calvin cycle the light independent reactions. And I think that's a little bit of a, a mistake also because as we look here, we know that the Calvin cycle is dependent upon the products of the light reactions. So, um, again, I'm not sure I like that uh, way of talking about it. So I just call it the Calvin cycle. But one thing we can say is that it is carbon fixation. And by carbon fixation, we mean taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it into a usable form. The Calvin cycle will consist of a complex series of reactions that occur in the stroma uh, of the chloroplast. Using carbon dioxide and the products of the light reactions, NADPH and ATP. So let's begin. Here we have carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, diffusing into the leaf and into a cell and into the stroma of the chloroplast, where it encounters a molecule called RUBP, or ribulose biphosphate, RU. BP. When RUBP binds with carbon dioxide, it forms a molecule that's a six carbon unstable intermediate. And because it's unstable, it immediately breaks apart into two three carbon molecules called PGA, or phosphoglycerate. So here's what the Calvin cycle looks like so far RUBP and carbon dioxide combine, forming an unstable intermediate with six carbons, which breaks into two molecules of PGA. So now we have PGA, and PGA gets phosphorylated, or gets energy, from ATP. Now where did the ATP come from? Recall that ATP is one of the products of the light reactions. So, when this PGA engages with a ATP, it becomes BPGA, or biphosphoglyceraldehyde. And notice we have an ADP. ADP used to be ATP, adenosine diphosphate, adenosine triphosphate, Here's the other phosphate group. So watch what happens again. A PGA becomes a BPGA, or biphosphoglycerate. The ADP can go back to the thylakoid to be used again in the light reactions. So now we have BPGA. BPGA combines with NADPH, also from the light reactions. And when it does, that NADPH, remember what NADPH was carrying, it's carrying a high energy electron that got boosted by light energy, and it's carrying a hydrogen or a proton. So the NADPH is going to donate that high energy electron at hydrogen to BPGA and convert it into PGAL, or phosphoglyceraldehyde. So let's watch that again. BPGA combines with NADPH which drops off an electron and a high energy, uh, a high energy electron and a hydrogen and converting BPGA into PGAL or phosphoglyceraldehyde. The NADP plus and this phosphate can go back to the thylakoids for the light reactions. So where are we now? We had PGA. We energize that PGA with ATP which converts the PGA into BPGA. It adds a phosphate group and then we bring in NADH, NADPH, 
and convert the BPGA into PGAL. Now we need to stop here for a moment and do a little bit of an accounting because we had two PGAs. So we need, let me grab a pen here, we need, and make it easy to write here, uh, two ATP making two BPGA, we have two ATP, it takes two NADPH, will make us two NAD plus, and we have two PGAL. So if we're doing an accounting uh, to keep the right numbers, this this is what we have right now. So two PGALs, two three carbon molecules. Now these two three carbon molecules is enough to make one six carbon sugar. So if we go back to our cycle, we take two PGALs and make a sugar. And now we're done. Wasn't that the point to make sugar? Let's look back at the overall reaction. We're going to make sugar. But the problem is, this is a cycle, and we've used up all of our, our, our pieces. We have two PGLs, and we use them. So we've got to think back a little bit. We look at this reaction, uh, or, or here rather, we have one carbon dioxide giving result, uh, res and one RUBP uh, eventually going through this series of reactions make two PGL, and two PGLs can make one glucose. But when we look at the overall reaction, we started with six carbon dioxides. So we need to go back in and do a little better accounting. Let's uh, grab a pen. I'm going to do this in black this time. And shut that. So uh, what we have is uh, our uh, six carbon dioxides making six unstable intermediates, breaking down into 12 PGAs, being energized by 12 ATP, releasing 12 ADP. We make each one of these PGAs becomes a bi-PGA or a biphosphoglycerate. We need 12 NADPHs. We're going to send back 12 NAD pluses and 12 phosphates. And each of these BPGAs becomes a PGAL. So we have 12 PGALs, and two of them go to make a sugar, which leaves us with 10. Let me uh, pull this up here. I think I have it there. Yes, 10 PGLs left. So we still have something to build off our cycle. So what do we do with these 10 PGLs? Well, here they are. I have 10 three carbon molecules, which means I have a total of 30 carbon. Let's see. I have uh, 30 carbon molecules to deal with. What happens to those 10 PGAL? Well, they get energized by 6 ATP, which rearranges those 10 PGLs into 6 RUBPs. Now, RUBP is a 5 carbon molecule. So, 6 5 carbon molecules is 30 carbon. So, we've taken into account um, all of our accounting. So, let's look at what that means on our cycle. We have our 10 PGL, and they get rearranged back to these 6 RUBPs. So there you have it, the Calvin cycle. Six carbon dioxides getting picked up by six RUBPs, making six unstable intermediates, which break into 12 phosphoglycerates, which get, re or get phosphorylized into 12 biphosphoglycerates. Uh, they get the high energy electrons and hydrogen from NADPH uh, to make 12 PGALs, two of which can be used to make sugar, 10 of which can be used to recombine the six RUBPs. Let's remind ourselves where everything that came into the cycle came from. The carbon dioxide came from the air, the, the uh, ATP and the NADPH and the ATP here all came from the light reactions. And our product is sugar, or at least the precursors to a sugar. Here are some of those names of those molecules. I know they're kind of hard to, uh, to spell or memorize, but uh, you know, write these down so you can use them correctly. We'll go by the abbreviations most of the time when we talk about it, but it's good to know the names to recognize them if you see them on a test or something else. All right, we'll come back for the next video where we're going to look at uh, some alternative pathways to carbon fixation besides just the Calvin cycle.